Alright, so there's probably a few reasons why you clicked on the video and all that, but most likely you're just here to learn more about Grim Dawn and exactly how to play it, what to do with it, what you need to look for for various things. And you know what? I might just have the answer. The thing that you're going to do upon opening up the game for the first time is, of course, create a character, obviously, and then probably wonder, how do I pick my class? It's fine, once you hit level 2, you'll get to pick a class, and once you hit level 10, You'll be able to pick a second class if you so desire. All you gotta really decide is if you want to be boy or girl. One checkbox is the veteran mode, which adds a lot of things that I kind of recommend anybody starts playing with. They might say, now, now hold up a minute. It says, increases the challenge in for experienced ARPG players. I just got the game. All right, I don't know what I'm doing. That's fine. Don't worry about it. All right, so what is veteran difficulty? Veteran difficulty increases the mob density, increases the hero spawn chance, and gives you more loot. Now it's certainly up to you whether or not you want to actually play veteran mode or not, probably also relying a bit more if you want to play hardcore difficulty. However, a lot of people say that going from normal to elite is challenging. Meanwhile, going from veteran to elite, it's smoother. But hey, chances are I had you with more loot. Alright, so, you've got your character then, you've named it something super cool, and you've decided to go veteran or hardcore, whatever, created it. Alright, now you've gone, you've noticed it says star, but you're like, man, this main campaign? Ooh, what are these options? First one, obviously main campaign is going to be the main campaign. Um, awesome game, if somehow you have modded this before your first even go. I'm not gonna judge, but that's that's a little weird. But anyways, you have a crucible mode. Now, if you've done any of the research and looked up guides or anything, you probably noticed a lot of them have been balanced around going to crucible and going up and score and getting as much loot as possible. And you're probably sitting there thinking, Man, that sounds pretty great. I kind of don't recommend starting off with Crucible. It's literally running around in a circle, killing things for a while. And if this is your first character, you're not going to get that far and you're not going to get that much loot. Chances are you're not going to gain that much experience. Going through the base game, your first try, your first time is good. Now, some people say to run it for a few waves, get a few tokens, and then level out your beginning devotions until it starts costing more. Um, that's up to you, man. If you want to do that, you can. Nothing that I do. I normally just like pushing through the main campaign and getting all my stuff that way. Oh, wait, 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 wait a second, wait a second. What, what is this Crucible game mode that you just talked about, you're saying right now? All right. So, to plainly state it, Crucible mode is a wave-based game mode that involves you killing waves and waves of enemies with a modifier and a score. And depending on what wave you complete, you get these tributes, and those tributes can be spent to unlock devotions or even some traps slash totems around the map area that you are in. Um, if you complete it, you gain a big reward, and if you die, you also gain a big reward minus one chest, it seems. Now, just because I'm not the biggest fan of it doesn't mean it's not good. Uh, a lot of people get a lot of rewards from it, and a lot of people like making builds for it. I just simply do not like it. It's kind of slow to me and there's not really a lot of fun running around in a circle not really getting anything until the end and most of the time whenever i've done other farming i've gotten more out of it than doing crucible but also i haven't fully gone into crucible like some people have crucible definitely has its own challenge and its own rewards i simply am not a fan However, most people recommend to go into Crucible at level 100 once you've gotten some decent gear. 
if you're able to beat the campaign you're perfectly fine to go in crucible if you're able to kill nemesis you are definitely perfectly fine to run crucible as you keep progressing wave by wave you end up running into mutators these change the way that the mobs are or you are plus the entire time playing through crucible you have a man insulting you and your abilities i mean if that's your kind of thing i'm not gonna king shame is that all you can muster so the verdict is you should probably stay away from crucible unless you really really want to push a few waves get up to wave 10 restart and just keep doing that for tributes and gaining your first devotions now it's not exactly necessary to do this because the campaign itself has way more than enough devotions to fill out the devotion cap. Plus, if for some reason you start pushing really far into Crucible at a really low level, you're going to start running into Nemesis enemies, which are kind of difficult, hit really hard, and in Crucible, they're a little bit toned down, but they still pack a punch. Now, there is another mode called the Shattered Realm coming out, in which you go through an infinite dungeon, and it looks like it's similar scored as Crucible, and even has a similar loot at the end like Crucible does. The footage that we see of it involves going through it, collecting score, and even at the end where you beat a boss, aka what looks like a wave, you have the option of continuing or getting your reward, assuming that it all works similarly to the way that Crucible does in that respect. Something I've seen once or twice from people streaming it and playing the game is that when you die, you leave beyond a grave, and inside of that grave is a portion of your experience and that you should probably go back and grab it. So something that I luckily saw on Reddit before making this video is that some people don't know that you can just simply pause the game whenever you want as long as you're in single player. This can be useful for seeing what effects do that are currently on you as well as looking at mutators in the crucible. And finally, another thing that I'm pretty sure most people don't know is that you can set a key binding for both your health potion and your energy potion without having to have it on your bar. All right, let's let's get into before we get into anything involving characters. Let's just get into the general vague description of everything, and let's start with the different types of damage that you will encounter. I'll start off by saying that while most damage types have a damage over time version the main effect does not increase the damage over time for instance burn is not increased by fire damage but by burn damage as a separate value that is normally paired together with fire for instance so let's start off simple with physical damage which is ironically probably one of the more complicated damage types simply because it can be negated by armor and physical resistance, yet physical resistance is rare. Um, it has a dot called internal trauma damage, which I believe, from what I've read, is only negated by physical resistance. Physical damage is also increased by cunning. Next up we have elemental damage, which is technically divided into three categories of fire, cold, and lightning. If you run across anything that's plus percentage elemental, things get a little weird in which if it's a percentage, it's added 100% to each of them. So for instance, 30% elemental is 30% fire, 30% cold, 30% lightning. However, if you have, for instance, 30 plus 30 flat elemental damage, then it's 10 fire damage, 10 cold damage, 10 lightning damage. All elemental damage is increased by spirit. A sort of weird pairing, poison and acid. Poison being the damage over time and then acid being just the standard's damage. It's also affected by spirit and the damage over time of it, the poison, is sort of notorious for doing a lot of damage to you, the player. Now piercing damage is kind of weird because it sounds like it should be physical damage but it's not. It's its own type of damage and it has no damage over time attached to it like some of the other ones do. Piercing damage is also affected by cunning and definitely should not be confused with any of the pierce armor effects on some weapons. Also bleeding has nothing to do with physical damage 
nor piercing, but is a damage over time effect only. It is affected by cunning. I've always liked vitality damage for some reason, but whenever I look at any of the resists for monsters, it seems to be that a lot of them have a very high vitality resistance compared to everything else. Some examples involve some where they have a much higher resistance for one thing, but across the board it seems like vitality is kind of higher up in the resistance scale. But every time I've ever used vitality, it tends to actually do quite a bit of damage, like everything else, as long as you build for it. It has a damage over time ability, quite simply named Vitality Decay Damage. Vitality damage along with Vitality Decay Damage are increased by Spirit. Ah, Aether Damage. It's basically green fire, except it doesn't have a dot. It's done by the Ethereals and basically resisted by the Ethereals. It's, it's magic damage, basically. It's affected by Spirit. A lot of reduced health goes in with a lot of the abilities that do chaos damage, but it's not affected by it. Uh, chaos damage is an increased reduction in enemy health, but not a lot of classes actually do chaos damage. I know quite a few people have been asking for extra additions and more love for chaos damage. Chaos damage is increased by spirit as well. Now, that's all the standard types of damage that exists. However, there is something that all of these can be, and that is retaliation. So, retaliation is the type of damage that you do when something hits you. It's called thorns in other games, but in this, it's retaliation. So, the fun thing about retaliation is a lot of the stuff that you get is plus percentage to all retaliation damage, which means all of these damage types, plus to all of them for just retaliation. So normally, stacking into nothing but retaliation and trying to build a character around just doing retaliation damage made for a very fun sort of thing of one-shotting everything that hits you and then beating on ranged guys for a good minute. However, with the Forgotten Gods expansion, they're reworking a lot of abilities to take a percentage of your retaliation damage and applying it to specific abilities. This is beautiful. See, the thing with retaliation is you could have it do 30,000 damage. You could have it do hundreds of thousands of damage. You could have it do insane amounts of damage, but for the most part, a lot of things wouldn't get hit by it. However, with the new expansion coming out, I already have builds lined up, a lot of other people have builds lined up, and it's gonna be a very fun and wild just start. I'll probably talk more about this at some point if this does well in any way um, about retaliation later, but for now, uh, that's pretty much what retaliation is all about. Just something hits you and you hit them back, basically. You can have other abilities and there's quite a few classes that add retaliation. So now that I've talked about the different types of damages that exist, I believe it's about time now that we get into resistance. Now, in my experience, you don't have to go heavy into resistance in veteran. You probably don't have to touch resistances all that much in normal, except for poison and acid later on in Ashes of Malmau. There's a little bit of bleeding that really hurts, and some aether that hurts. Um, normally you can sort of shift around your resistances depending on what area you are in as well as who you are fighting. Some obvious things are Cathonic and the Cult of Cthun deal chaos damage with some vitality. Ethereals deal Aether damage. Beasts sometimes deal bleeding, sometimes also deals poison. Um, Crownley's Gang deals fire, piercing, and bleeding. Basically everything does physical of some sort. And um, elemental is sort of all around because some hero enemies have different elemental 
effects that they just sort of have thrown on them. Now, when you start going to the Gloomwald, also known as your starting ashes of Malmouth, you're probably going to want to at least have poison resistance. There's so much poison, mortars of poison, poison is raining down upon you, guys that you kill explode into poison, you're being poisoned, and it's just nothing but poison 24-7. You probably want some poison resistance. There's a resistance for every single effect. Now, if you look at any of the stats, you'll notice that piercing and bleeding are technically underneath the physical section. When you look at your damage percentage increases, this does not mean that physical resistance affects those damage types. You still need piercing resistance to resist piercing damage and you still need bleeding resistance to resist bleeding. Physical resistance does nothing for that except for physical damage along with eternal trauma damage. Honestly, the one damage type that you probably don't, you're not going to have that much issues really filling out for resistance wise is probably elemental damages because they're all bundled into one. You find things with elemental resistance, you find fire, coal, lightning resistance, all that sort of stuff gets bundled up in elemental. So you end up having all three of those really high pretty easily. Another thing to mention is later on, which I'll describe, which are devotions, chances are the damage type that you put into the devotions will end up increasing the resistances of that type. So you'll probably end up with a high amount of a specific resistance. This can be kind of annoying because a lot of the gear kind of has some um, weird overlap where the type of damage you're doing is also the kind of resistance you get. So you kind of have to sort of forsake one piece of gear that might be a big damage boost in for favor of a more defensive option for later on but that's up to you to decide components when augments which i'll get into later can also increase your resistances resistances lower the damage of those specific kinds by the percentage of it so if you have 80 percent resistance you only take 20% of the damage. Potions that you get from factions as well as bosses and even crafting can also be used to raise your resistance temporarily but for a good amount of time. Now that we've got resistances out of the way we can actually start talking about how armor works. So armor is actually sort of complicated but it's also kind of nice. So when a physical attack actually hits you it rolls to see what part of your body it actually hits you in. For instance, your head has a 15% chance of getting hit, your shoulders have a 15% chance of getting hit, your chest has a 26%, your arms a 12, your legs a 20, and your feet a 12. So for instance, if you have a very armored chest piece but a very unarmored set of gauntlets, getting hit in your arms would cause more physical damage than if you get hit in your chest. So now that that's been discussed, what is armor and armor absorption exactly? Well, armor is the raw base amount that a physical attack is reduced by. If you have a thousand armor and you get hit by an attack that does 2000 damage, you will take 1000 damage. However, armor absorption, the percentage is basically the percentage of effectiveness that your armor actually has. For instance, you, I believe you start off with a maximum of 70 armor absorption. So for instance, if you don't have any components that increase it or anything else that increases it, if you have a thousand armor, technically speaking, only 700 of it will be reducing that 2000 damage. It unfortunately is not possible to get your armor absorption past 100%. Now that we've finished talking about armor, I can start talking about shields. Shields, unlike most other ARPGs, do not have any armor associated with 
Instead, there is a percent chance of blocking and along with a cooldown which is block recovery associated with the shield. When you successfully block, the damage is reduced by the stat damage blocked. Now unfortunately, while the shield tells you the cooldown of the block recovery directly on it, it's not actually showing the stat affected by your block recovery reduction. That's pretty much it with what shields are all about and what they actually do. So now I'll move on to three things that kind of get confused a bunch, which are absorption, deflection, and reflection, uh, specifically deflection and reflection. Now I'll start off simple and just say absorption is sort of just saying energy absorption. The damage done to you with a spell, the energy that was used to cast it, part of it is given to you based on your energy absorption. No damage is reduced by any way, shape, or form with this stat at all. Now, deflection and reflection are where people get really confused most of the time. Now, a classic example of reflection is say you take 1000 fire damage, you have 80% fire resistance, you take 200 in the end, and then you have 100% reflection. You still take the 200 fire damage, but then you do 200 fire damage to the attacker. When done by the player, it's not really that great, but generally when you're attacking an enemy that can reflect, it can hurt really bad. Now deflect is when you take the percentage of deflect that you have and directly reduce anything that hits you. If you have 100% deflection, you're basically invincible, but that's only assigned to specific very long cooldown abilities. Now another thing that a lot of people kind of get confused about is constitution, specifically what it is. Constitution is a yellow bar that goes over your health. When you leave combat, your life pool will rapidly regenerate. You regain constitution from a number of ways, either by finding rations lying around, having them drop rarely, or having vital essence drop from monsters, specifically hero and boss enemies. It's a very useful stat that when you're in combat and you don't get hit for that long, you start regenerating life pretty quickly. However, if you have any reductions to your health regeneration, even a small amount from various effects, it does not work ever. Even if you leave combat, the game will constantly think that you are in combat and will not regenerate your life from the constitution even if your health regen is higher than your constant health drain. It also won't start healing you until all of the damage over time effects that are on you are gone. So let's go ahead and just round off all of the defensive just stats and abilities with, funnily enough, defensive ability. So defensive ability, quite simply put, is the opposite of offensive ability. In fact, whenever something hits something, the offensive ability is put up against the defensive ability. So basically what it is, is your chance to be hit as well as your chance to be critically hit. There is a percentage to hit threshold, however, and that appears to be 75%. And if you go any lower, then it starts taking away damage done. And about 90% percentage to hit, then critical strike chance starts to come into effect. I'll touch back on to the actual mechanics when I actually start talking about offensive ability in the next segment. So we just finished talking about everything defensive. We'll go ahead and move into all the damagey stuff, starting with attack and cast speed. So I'll just start off with saying the maximum for both of these values is 200%. Um, sometimes you'll have a skill that seems like it would be attack, but is more cast, such as force wave from the soldier skill tree. There obviously isn't a lot of time to just be able to sit here and say what every single skill is, whether or not it's a castable skill or an attack skill. So I'll just simply say, learn what your abilities are and what they actually use, because these two stats are really kind of important, as it's basically a percentage that's applied to your damage after everything. Sometimes a low amount of attack speed and cast speed is a lot better than a slightly higher amount of any kind of damage percentage that you have. Both attack speed and cast speed are really useful depending on what ability you're actually using. 
However, you want to be careful on your energy costs because sometimes you can start using way too much energy than you're able to supply and not having enough energy to use an ability definitely lowers your damage. So, as you probably noticed, a lot of your skills have a maximum amount that you can put in them. Um, you kind of can't put it past whatever the number is on the right side. However, you can definitely increase it past that with plus skills gear. Another thing to mention is, for instance, this skill only has one point in it. However, I cannot cast a specific amount. All skills have a max that they can reach, which means technically speaking, you can have more skills that give plus skills to one skill that you're using to the point where you can't put enough points in to reach the base maximum. This is kind of good because it basically allows you to have free skill points to throw anywhere you want. In most cases, having gear that adds plus to your skills is a lot better than plus percentage of damage types because it adds a flat amount of damage to the skill specifically. It won't increase your overall damage to everything across your character, but it will definitely increase the damage of a specific skill you're using, which is quite important if it's for instance your main damaging skill that you use. I always recommend if you're not sure to just experiment with it and see if it actually does more damage or not. Look at the specific numbers of the skill. Look at your overall damage when you're fighting. There's training dummies in town, so you can easily test things out on those if you so need. So, on quite a few items and even quite a few skills, there is a stat known as health damage, which literally is what it says. It does a percentage damage of the entity's health that it hits. This can be the player, this can be a monster, anything else really. And this sounds great, especially if you go, man, I can just take 50% of some guy's life instantaneously? Hell yeah. However, quite a few bosses and higher up enemies have resistance against this to the point where it's kind of not that great. You'll notice that it does a lot of damage against smaller normal trash mobs that have a white name or yellow name, but when you run into hero enemies, act bosses or even story bosses or even the secret bosses towards the end it doesn't do a lot if you have like 50 percent damage and you are normally two shotting guys when you hit a boss you'll end up doing more 10 percent damage you know notice it just sort of does kind of normal damage there's quite a few bosses that have insane resistance to this stat just that way you can't instantly kill it for instance, looking at Warden Krieg through Grim Tools, it specifically says 88% resistance to life reduction. Now, let's talk about a lot of people's favorites. Pets. So, pets are pretty strong, however, they are kind of a pain to actually gear for because they scale off of a stat known as pet bonuses. These can be kind of a pain in the ass to actually find, especially while leveling. These include life, damage, attack speed, cast speed, run speed, offensive ability, defensive ability, physical resistance, fire resistance, cold resistance, lightning resistance, poison slash acid resistance, pierce resistance, bleed resistance, vitality resistance, aether resistance, and chaos resistance. Pets can even later on gain taunting abilities and some even start with the ability to taunt. For some devotions, you can have them taunt whenever you're attacked. They're really useful for just soaking up a lot of extra enemies. However, some bosses have resistance to being taunted. An ability that has taunt on it basically allows the enemy that is affected by said taunt to immediately change its focus onto you. Or, in this case, a pet. Another thing that I'd like to mention is that after a specific point you'll start noticing that a lot of the damage numbers, specifically the damage per second on a weapon, will start lying to you. If you're playing as a caster character, you should be ignoring this value anyways because all of your skills don't have weapon damage on it. This section is specifically made just for the people that are going to be using weapon damage, so people that are going to actually be hitting things. A good practice is to always look at the actual damage of your skills or even other parts of the character sheet when switching out gear and to pay attention to specifically 
the flat damage types that it gives as well as the percentage damage types that it gives if you're hitting things definitely look at the attacks per second and also the raw damage number because half of the time it'll tell you that a weapon is better and you go switch it out and then suddenly you're doing less damage for a lot of your skills it basically isolates the weapons that you have equipped so your main hand your off hand or if you're using a two-handed your one two-handed against whatever you're looking at so it doesn't take into account all the other increases that you have on your character it just specifically compares your main hand your off hand with whatever you're comparing it with so a good practice that also sort of helps the last point that i made it's to just sort of pick one damage type that you sort of like to do later on you'll end up having more than one definitely but become aware of what your class does for damage and what your skills actually do because if you know that you can easily stack up damage and be able to kill and clear any of the content in the game later on there'll be epics and even legendaries and even sometimes magic and rare items that combo two different types of damage that both suit you because a lot of, of these abilities have multiple types of damage on them you'll be easily be able to increase your damage quite a bit however early on you can easily focus on a specific type of damage and run with it it'll perk perfectly fine it's viable basically any skill in this game you can just pick up and run with it as long as you know what to build for with it so now I have dealt with that little tidbit um, we should probably focus back on offensive ability specifically all the mechanics of it offensive ability as I explained earlier is paired up against defensive ability whenever you hit something it's always your offensive ability against their defensive ability and that's what determines your critical strike chance your hit chance and even your crit damage so basically how critical strike is calculated is it takes your chance to hit after 90 percent and basically every percentage after that is your critical strike chance if you have five percent critical strike chance then your hit chance is going to be 95 percent and that goes up to a hundred percent chance to hit that'll be 10 percent critical strike chance and then your chance to hit stays at a hundred but it keeps going up in that specific way you'll technically have a 100% chance to hit but a 20% critical strike chance however your hidden chance to hit would be 110% this isn't shown because you can't hit 110% of the time you can only hit 100% of the time now the information I found on how critical damage is calculated is a little old so I'll just simply say that the higher your offensive ability goes the more your critical damage kind of increases but a lot of gear sort of adds to that and is quite strong making sure your offensive ability is sort of decently high to where you're able to hit things properly and get a little bit of critical strike chance is kind of important however a lot of bosses have a much higher defensive ability so you'll probably notice that you'll have high critical strike chance against a lot of normal mobs but against bosses and heroes you might see it lower a bit so let's talk about what happens if you go below 75 percent chance to hit so think about it as at 75 percent you do 100 percent of your damage however if you go below 75 percent you'll still have a 75 percent chance to hit however anytime you do hit you will do less damage for instance 70 percent would do 93.33 percent damage that's pretty much it for offensive ability and also even a little bit of defensive ability it's kind of hard to get down to 75 percent chance to hit but if you're pushing content really fast and hitting things that are a much higher level then you're probably not going to be having a good time I'll touch pretty quickly on what conversion really is and what it basically does. So conversion is when it takes the flat numerical amount of damage and converts it into a different type. For instance, if you have physical damage and you're converting it into fire, if you have a thousand percent extra physical damage, it's not going to count that when converting your 100 physical damage. Instead, it's going to take that 100 and turn it into fire. 
If you have 10% conversion, it's going to take 10 of that 100, turn it into fire, and then you're going to have 90 physical, which in that 90 is multiplied by your physical percentage damage and any other increases. Conversion is a pretty powerful just stat to have on anything. When applied to skills, it generally only means for that specific skill. If it's on gear, it's global across everything. Another thing that is also confusing is definitely life steal. Specifically in the fact that if you have gear that adds life steal onto it, it only affects anything with attack damage. Which means if you have a skill that does a lot of damage that you hit a weapon with, chances are it's not actually doing the full thing that you think it is. See, in a lot of skills, there's a weapon damage stat on it. That basically is the damage that your weapon is doing being added to the actual attack itself. So when you're attacking with lifesteal, it only calculates the lifesteal that you have with the attack damage on that skill, or if you just hit something normally with a weapon. However, if a skill has lifesteal on it, it tends to apply to the entirety of the skill and the damage that it does. Still, lifesteal is a pretty great stat. It allows you to have your health go from really low to super high in an instant and really helps for some nice heart attack. I'm always a fan of seeing the health bar go straight up from down, just going back and forth crazily. It's actually a lot of fun for me. So now we talked about lifesteal and everything, let's just talk about the other bar, energy, specifically when you need more and what you can do to help gain more. So I talked about absorption, which is basically whenever you get hit by a spell, the percentage of absorption is applied to the energy cost of that spell and it gets sent to you. However, there's a few more ways of gaining energy. So energy leech works exactly the same way that lifesteal works. It kind of makes sense. However, generally energy leech is a flat amount and not really a percentage. But when you hit something, you need a weapon damage percentage on it. You need to be hitting it with your weapon basically to actually apply the energy leech and be able to take energy from them. Now you might be thinking, geez, that kind of sounds like a kind of bad way of actually gaining energy. Surely there's a better way as my spellcaster I can gain more energy. And I'll answer to you, yes. There is energy regen. If you increase your energy enough, your base regen will go up, it seems. And if you just keep stacking energy regen, basically, you might not ever need energy again as long as you have potions and energy potions are quite useful. There's only a few characters that I've really needed a lot of energy for, and that's mostly Aether Rain, Essence Tray, which on their own used up a lot of energy. Just sort of gauge exactly what you need for your energy uses. Sometimes just using the energy potion is perfectly fine. I've had plenty of characters where I don't even need energy. I normally never drink a potion because the amount of energy that I use is so low. However, for spell casters, you definitely will run into this issue of needing energy, but some need it more than others. Always just try to gauge exactly how much energy you need and what your energy requirements are for your build that you are making. Now we'll begin to touch on to the next part, the loot, the gear, what you should be picking up, how to handle your loot filter, and a bunch of other nice, fun things that you need to know about the game. So uh, there's these nice things that drop called components. You basically use them for crafting, you use them for devotion shrines to uh, unlock them, and you also use them to put onto your gear for various extra bonus effects. They're pretty great. You should probably pick them all up whenever you see them. They drop, they have this nice little orange color on them, and they're separate from the loot filter and always show up. There is a rarity base on them. As you can see on the screen, I have a lot more specific components than others. Some people like to stop picking up, for instance, scavenge plating once they hit like 100 or something. However, I like to hoard literally everything until the end of time. Don't judge me. So if you see a little orange name on the ground highlighted nicely, you should probably pick it up. Otherwise, you might not be able to craft things later on. All right, so you've gotten your loot filter and everything, and you're like, cool. I can't wait to turn off all these stupid yellow and green items, because lol, they're pretty bad. Stop right there for just a minute. You see, a lot of the times people just think that it's bad just because, you know, it's a lower tier. However, I've had plenty of times where I've had 
basically the perfect items while leveling, especially even later on and whatnot, where it's plus a lot to my specific type of damage, and it's got plus to my actual skills that I use. Same with rares. There are some rares out there that are better than epics. Bite me. What you should be doing instead is having these on. You can turn common off, but let's be honest, I like to mess with people that come into my Twitch chat and tell me, why are you picking up those quality items? Because I like to sell them. Anyways, you have, you should be selecting what types of damage you do and your mastery while leveling. You can customize this however you want. However, you should definitely be keeping magic items on. You can always just simply configure your loot filter in a way of which these all show up still and you have it set to where acid for instance in my masteries this item is a monster infrequent and a rare however it's not showing up with anything that i have given it so you can always set it up so that way your class and what you want to have actually drop and show up will always show up you can always for instance if i set it back to acid Hold Alt to see it highlighted on the ground. It's pretty basic and simple, but still quite usable. I'll touch really quickly upon what epic and legendary items really are. Legendaries spawn after level 50, and you can even spawn before it, but they have a minimum level requirement of 50. Epics and legendaries always spawn with the same kind of stats. They can be rolled higher and lower, but they will always have the same base stats but different integers in it. Monster infrequents are kind of similar in which they drop from specific monsters and tend to have the same stats, however they can generate with a lot more stats added onto them. Sets are on epic and legendary equipment. They are always bonuses whenever you equip multiple of the same set together on your character you will gain specific bonuses depending on how many that you have equipped. They're quite powerful and quite frankly they're used in a lot of end game builds and are just generally strong no matter what. Another thing that I touched upon when I talked about resistances was potions. Potions are very good and help for filling out other sort of numbers on your character sheet such as resistances or even damage types. They can be used to give you more retaliation damage. They can even be used to deal damage in an area. However, I'm going to be specifically talking about the buffing potion. For the most part, you will be gaining recipes or blueprints to make these potions. The buffing potions can help you push for higher resistances without needing gear. They can also help you gain more life steal or even health regen, increase your max health, increase the damage, your attack speed, your movement speed. There's so many things that potions can do. However, the only downside is they are a duration. They are consumable and they cost something to acquire. Also to touch back upon various types of gear, there are caster subsets and heavy subsets of various armor. These, the subset for heavy requires more physique and the subset for caster generally requires less physique. However, they require spirit. A lot of various weapons require physique, cunning, and spirit. Mostly casters require spirit. Swords and one-handed sometimes require a lot of cunning and also physique. Two-handed always require physique. However, you can easily see what you need for gear just by looking at the item. A base of about 500 spirit is kind of required to wear any jewelry in the game. That's right, jewelry requires spirit and that's the only thing it requires. However, most classes are able to fill this out pretty easily and wear it no matter what. You also probably will notice that in the bottom left of your character sheet, there is a slot that is kind of weird that nothing drops for it. That's because there's only one quest that really gives you one and you mostly have to make them. They're called relics. You get your first ability to make one after beating Warden Krieg and you get the drop that you need to actually craft it yourself. Uh, you have to be level 18 in order to use these and there's three tiers as you progress through the game that you might be switching between. 
These relics can be expensive the more and more you get in them, but they tend to be very powerful and built around various play styles. Now, I really wanted to get into all the different classes and devotions. However, I'm starting to realize that this is a 45 minute long video and I should definitely be wrapping it up. I'm going to definitely be planning on doing a full-on explanation of masteries and the different types of what they do, what type of damage they do, what kind of abilities they have, as well as how all devotion works. Pretty much I'll just simply leave you with, for devotion, all you really need to look for is there's a search bar at the very top of it, and also you should be picking things that complement your damage. Also look for abilities that lower resistance. All the abilities that are marked with a red star are technically procced when you apply them to a ability that you already have. They're quite useful. You should definitely pick up a few of them, but make sure that you don't grab too many as you may not have enough abilities to actually use them all. They level up naturally just by having them attached to an ability that you have and by killing things, doing quests I believe. Anything that gives experience, they also gain experience from that. They do not lower the amount of experience you gain either. So by all means, attach them to a skill and level them up and use them. They're quite useful. If for some reason you mess up with the devotions, you can always refund them. They're a little bit costly in the beginning in Aether Crystal. However, all you have to really do is go to a spirit guide and click on the devotion segment and then just click on the ones that you want to refund. You can also put points into one and have it support itself basically. This is done by putting points into one devotion, then putting points into another, and then you'll have enough of the five different affinities as shown on the left side of the entire interface. You can do some nice sort of mixing around and get your ideal build this way, but keep in mind that it can get kind of costly, but by all means experiment. You can also refund your mastery points for any of your skills at the spirit guide too. Also, you can refund your bottom mastery bar, which a lot of people don't know about. So yeah, hopefully this at least helps somebody out. Um, hopefully it didn't take up too much time, but it's quite a long video and I'll be making a text guide after this and um, that's pretty much it. Check me out on stream. I'm gonna be playing Forgotten Gods when it comes out. I'm quite excited for it, in fact. So, uh, yeah, see ya. Twitch link in the description. See ya. Bye.